Hey, it's Jim, and this is FRM Part 2, the topic on credit risk measurement and management, and the chapter on derivatives, which is one of my favorite topics. And it's one of my favorite topics because, as I tell students and candidates over the years, the more you know about derivatives and their pricing and their pricing models, the more you know about everything else there is in finance, and in particular, credit risk measurement and management. Now, I'm guessing that you guys are aware that derivative securities have gotten a super bad name over the last couple of decades. Um, you might remember politicians blaming the 2008 financial crisis on those uh, greedy Wall Street banks and their overuse of these risky derivative securities. I wasn't very happy with those kinds of comments, but uh, in this chapter, there's a quote from a famous investor who called derivatives financial weapons of mass destruction. I, of course, wasn't happy with that. I'll agree, these are complex securities. Uh, but when used properly, they can be uh, about the most efficient means of identifying risk, quantifying risk, and then, uh, and then managing risk. You've heard me say that bunches and bunches of times. So I'm going to try to convince you during the course of this slide deck that these are really cool things. Maybe you know about them already, but of course you need to be aware of the consequences of misusing them. There's a reference inside of this chapter on a 1994 Procter and Gamble scandal over the use of uh, swap contracts. And uh, I give this as a case to, uh, to my students. It's really one of the craziest things out there. Uh, but that's a conversation for a different day. If you got five minutes, look up Procter and Gamble uh, and, and swap contracts. But what I'm going to do here is start out with a super simple example, and I'm going to refer to this as we go through, uh, as we go through this slide deck. Uh, like many of you, I love going to the farmer's market. We have a weekly one here on Fridays. One of the reasons that I love going to it is because uh, one of my old schoolmates, I'll call her Betty, uh, she runs and makes and sells chocolate chip cookies. And I go back and talk to Betty, and it's really fun visiting with her once or twice a month, and I'll buy... Uh, some chocolate chip cookies. My whole family, we love these kinds of things. So let's suppose I go to Betty and say, you know what? My wife is turning 60 next year. I would love to buy a thousand chocolate chip cookies. Can I order that right now? And let's agree on a time and let's agree on a price and let's agree on a delivery mechanism so that I can get these chocolate chip cookies to this big party that I'm planning on throwing. And by the way, it's a surprise. Don't tell anybody. Uh, so here are a couple of questions that we're going to answer in uh, inside of this slide deck. Um, what price are we going to agree on for the delivery of these chocolate chip cookies in a year? You know, suppose the price today is a dollar a cookie. You know, are we going to agree on a dollar ten or maybe ninety cents? Probably not ninety. Maybe a dollar twenty-five. Um, how are we going to deliver these things? Am I going to pick them up, or is Betty going to deliver them to the party? Is she going to deliver them to my house? What happens if Betty decides not to make the cookies? What if her machine breaks down? What if she declares bankruptcy? What if she's insolvent? What if, what if we have all of these kinds of things? Now, Betty and I know each other, so we could probably work this out, but suppose that we don't know each other. So this is credit risk in kind of the broad sense, but it's really third party risk, counterparty risk. And that's going to be a super important concept as we go through this. Now with Betty and I, we're, we're probably in the over the counter market, right? So it's tailored and customized to our particular and unique needs. But lots of these derivatives trade on organized exchanges, which uh, are characterized by standardization. And so they're all different sorts of mechanisms uh, under which Betty and I can make this a happy delivery uh, for this surprise 60th birthday party for my wife. But remember, lots and lots of things can go wrong. So just imagine that scenario and relate it to the future delivery of corn or a barrel of oil or the 500 stocks in the S&P 500 index. So it gets way more complexified. So there is some truth to what the politician said and what the well-known investor said, but that truth lies in the fact that people involved were not able to identify the risks, quantify the risk, and manage the risk. So as we look through these um, learning objectives, and, and by the way, I've said this uh, a couple of times in my introduction, 
You know, I have students and candidates over the years say, you know, we, there's a lot of learning objectives. Which ones do you think are the most important or the or more important? And I really, you know, I don't want to, I don't ever want to say this, but I'll, I'll answer it. And you've heard me say this before. If I were making up questions, uh, I would focus on those first two. I mean, clearly in the beginning of this chapter, we're going to talk about exchange traded and OTC derivatives. And then the clearing mechanism. This is super important. And then um, look at the bottom there, advantages and disadvantages of, you know, this concept of do we clear it centrally or do we clear it out there somewhere else? And then finally, these, uh, these extra kind of entities that exist out there. So I think those are probably uh, questions that I would ask on the exam, but I'm going to say it again. I'm going to go ahead and, you know, just give the party line. You know, every learning objective is a potential exam question. All right, let's start, let's start on derivatives. So you guys know this right from uh, previous conversations. Down at the bottom, there's a forward contract. That was the example between Betty and me for the chocolate chip cookies. But if they're standardized and traded on an organized exchange, that's what a futures contract is. Futures contracts are nothing more than standardized forward contracts. And then skip over to the end, swap contracts. Now these can be, these are mostly over the counter, but a swap contract is really nothing more than a series of consecutive forward contracts. So the tenor of swaps might be three years or five years or seven years or, or even longer. I mean, I guess you and I could come up with a swap contract where we would agree to swap a fixed uh, interest rate for a floating interest rate for the rest of our lives. Imagine how much fun that would be when every six months we got together to see whether interest rates have gone up or gone down and we could do this for the next, well, you know, I'm in my 60s, so I probably won't make it for 20 more years. So that would be a 20 year swap, right? Now, those three that I just described, those are contracts. Those are legal and binding contracts that are enforceable by the court of law. <clears throat> Options, on the other hand, are not legal and binding contracts. They can be, but the very definition of an option, you have the right, but not the obligation. And so with an option contract, you have the right to do something, but you also have the right to do nothing. Now, if you have the right to do something, then you have a legal and binding uh, uh, contract, but you can always, you can always do nothing uh, if you want to. So good questions then here are what kind of risks are associated with this? And the risk essentially go back to what I was saying about my contract with Betty. Let's suppose we agree on $1.25 as the forward price. So a year goes by or whenever my wife's birthday comes along and let's suppose that the spot price, the current market price a year from now on chocolate chip cookies is exactly $1.25. Well, then Betty and I will be perfectly happy to go ahead and make that exchange. But what if in some extreme example, suppose that a chocolate chip cookie is worth $5. So Betty could be making chocolate chip cookies and selling them for five, but she agreed to sell me a thousand for just a dollar twenty-five. Oh my gosh, this is now market risk. This is now credit risk. So market risk, you know, prices fluctuate. But if the price is $5 and Betty had agreed to sell me those cookies for only $1.25, she may come to me and say, you know what, Jim, I, I really liked you back in the old days, but I don't like you that much to drive my business into the ground. So I'm going to default on this contract. So that's, that's credit risk right there. And what happens then, the greater the market risk, then the greater is the credit risk. In other words, the farther away the future spot price is, from that derivative price, in my case, it was a forward price, then, uh, then the greater is the credit risk. And then go ahead and skip one, dynamic risk management. Well, then we need to worry about counterparty risk because what Betty and I could have done is we could have gone to a bank and said to the bank, hey, will you step in and take both sides of the transaction? So then that bank would pose as the counterparty risk entity. And so if Betty decided not to pay me, I could go get my value. I couldn't get the chocolate chip cookies from the bank, but I could get the value from the bank. Well, that counterparty risk depends on the quality of the bank. Maybe Betty's husband owns that bank and Betty's husband will say, well, I'm not paying you, Jim, you go somewhere else, right? So you see how these things are all interrelated, but I love that concept in there, dynamic risk management and then risk complexity. 
these are really, really great exam questions under which you say something like, all right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, mitigate this risk by signing a contract. I'm going to hire a counterparty, a clearing company out there who has impeccable, impeccable uh, credit risk credentials. Uh, but then there's other things to worry about. What about liquidity? I mean, how quickly am I going to be able to sell that contract that I have with Betty? Probably not at all. No one's going to buy that contract. Now flip that, flip that, and suppose that instead of me signing a contract for chocolate chip cookies, that my wife says, you know what? I would like for my 60th birthday, I would like an unlimited supply of sugar because she likes to put it in her coffee. So I could buy a futures contract on sugar. And then if the price goes too far in one direction or another, especially if it moves against me, then I could go ahead and call the futures exchange, right? The organized exchange, that clearinghouse corporation, and I could offset that right away. So sometimes there's lots of liquidity, some, sometimes there's not. So remember, and we'll talk about this as we go through the slide deck, that when you get to organized exchanges, you probably don't have too many liquidity issues, but you're still going to have credit risk and counterpart risk, but those organized exchanges go to great lengths to re reduce that. And then what does the bottom say down there? Something about, uh, you know, a jurisdiction or the court system. Of course, um, the court here in the state that I, in which I live could say something like, you know what, um, if you default on a forward contract for chocolate chip cookies, you have to spend 100 years in prison. <laughs> All right. So then what is that incentive for Betty? Betty's going to say, well, even if I lose a bunch of money, I'm going to go ahead and make Jim his chocolate chip cookies because I don't want to go to jail. Boy, what a crazy and silly example that is. But you know, my examples, hopefully you see this over the various slide decks, my extreme examples illustrate lots and lots of good points. All right, here's just a simple example of a handshake. And so this handshake can occur in the over-the-counter market. It could occur between you and I, or you and a bank, or me and an insurance company, or a government and a government. So these can be, you know, small entities, but they're mostly institutions that go out and do this. And so what are these, uh, what are the terms of the contract? Deliver the chocolate chip cookies or the sugar with a specific quality. I mean, of course, of course, if the chocolate chip cookies that I ordered were round with an average of 12 chocolate chips in each cookie. I mean, I'm not going to go and count and see if each one averages 12, but if I look and I pull out a handful and there's one here and two there, boy, that's a breach of the contract, right? So there's, there's quality of sugar, there's uh, quality of oil, there is quality of lumber, all of these things in a futures contract. And then not to mention when you go over to the financial derivatives out there, you know, if you have a broad index of stocks, well, you need to know what is in that index. So suppose today that we enter a futures contract to trade the S&P 500 index in a year. And during the course of the year, so during the course of the year, the, the Standard & Poor's, they take out six firms of the index and throw in six more firms. Well, we agreed on, 200, or on 500 stocks back then, but now it's not the same 500 stocks. Boy, how do we deal with those kinds of things? Is that a breach of a contract? Probably not, because we know regularly that, uh, that the S&P uh, changes its composition. But if we show up and we want to buy those 500 stocks in a year's time, and it's 500 di different stocks, like, like Jim's cement company inside of those 500, you're going to say, wait a minute, I don't know anything about Jim and his cement company. So look down at the bottom. There's a good, good couple of words down there. We always have to worry about the ability. So that's the breach of the contract that I was talking about up there, insolvency. But then the unwillingness, right? Betty may just say, you know what, Jim? I I never really liked you in high school and I don't like you now. I'm going to go ahead and play a joke on you and I'm just not going to deliver these cookies because I want your wife to be mad at you because for whatever reasons. I mean, these are silly examples. And by the way, Betty, she's about the nicest girl that uh, you could ever meet. All right, here's, uh, here's a couple of good questions here. Let's go ahead and 
uh, find the similarities and the differences between exchange traded derivatives and over the counter derivatives. So you need to know a little bit of, about a history lesson. You know, over the counter derivatives, let's call them forward contracts, they go back all the way to the Roman Empire, where Caesar would say something like, okay, were they called governors? Were they called, I don't even remember what they were called. Go over there to your land and sign a contract with all the farmers over there because next year I want five tons of corn and I want to put it in my, uh, my barn over here. So forward contracts. In the over-the-counter market, were standard. I'm sorry, were customized and tailored to those unique characteristics. But the problem with those things is that they had no secondary market. So in 1848, there were these 12 dudes who got together in Chicago and they said, "Let's standardize these forward contracts and call them futures contracts." So this was the beginning of exchange-traded derivatives. So let's start with over-the-counter. These are non-standardized, customized. Just think of Julius Caesar, right? Less regulated markets. I'm pretty sure Julius was the regulator back in then and back in those days. So if the terms of the contract, they probably were very favorable to him. And who knows what the consequences were if you didn't deliver uh, on, that, on that contract. Um, terms can be modified to match a desired risk. All right, so there's the, there's the customized part, part of this, benefits to hedging. And so notice there are just arrows between the end user and the end user. This is me and Betty, right, over the counter market. Um, here's a swap. So one, an example, here's a swap. Um, you know, the traditional swap is an interest rate swap where, and I said this earlier, where one of us agrees to pay a fixed and the other one agrees to pay a floating rate. We could do this over three years or five years or a hundred years if we wanted to. We can uh, we can swap currencies. When you read about that Procter and Gamble, I'm hoping that some of you even type that in while I'm uh, while I'm lecturing you here in this slide deck. You read about Procter and Gamble interest rate swaps and currency swaps. This is back when the when the German mark was uh, the currency in Germany. And so hopefully if you've read these, you're scratching your head and you're saying, how could this have possibly happened? Nobody on either side of the transaction, they didn't identify the risk, they didn't quantify the risk, and they thought they were managing the risk, but you know, that's, uh, that doesn't happen. Now, exchange traded markets, these are super different. So this goes back to 1848, standardized, highly regulated. So if they're standardized, that means that you can get out of the contract whenever you want. Remember, these futures exchanges are characterized by um, marking to market and daily settlement. So every day there's a winner and a loser who is uh, who is declared. For those of you who love movies, you've heard me say this before, pause the video right now and go watch Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd in uh, Trading Places. They uh, had inside information on the price of orange juice, so they shorted orange juice futures contracts. Super liquid, right? I mean, uh, Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd, they got rich enough to buy a big yacht and go vacation on an island with a couple of beautiful women, and everybody lived happily after, after ever after. But that only occurred in that movie because of standardization and liquidity and transparency. If this would have been an over-the-counter market transaction, uh, I'm not sure that Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd would have even won by the end of that particular day. Ah, oh, never count out uh, Mortimer and Randolph Duke. Those of you who are younger out there, you're probably scratching your head saying, what in the heck is Jim talking about? All right, so look down at the bottom there. We've got an end user at the bottom and then an end user up at the top. So let me just go back here quickly. Where was that? You know, end user and end user. This is Betty and me having this kind of conversation and a formal handshake agreement. Maybe maybe we wrote it in, uh, in on a piece of paper, but I probably wouldn't have done that. But now look at all the people that we have involved. So if you and I wanted to trade a lumber futures contract, well, one of us is probably a construction company. One of us is probably um, a timberland company owner. So we want to hedge our risk. You know, there was the word hedge in one of those previous slides. So what do we do? We pick up the phone and we call our local financial intermediary. Maybe that's a bank. Maybe it's an insurance company. Maybe it's just 
somebody that we know who knows somebody on the exchange. So the purple in there is the actual exchange, whether that exchange is in uh, New York or Chicago or any other city throughout the world. And so note, when you have all of these people in between, all of these entities in between the end users, it has to be complexified or it has to be streamlined or it has to be standardized. So we do all those things to, well, let me just go back here, to try to match the simplicity of the over-the-counter market, but we add extra advantages to them. So let's look at... Uh, Let's look at a couple of slides here. Wait a minute, I'm gonna go right there. There's, there's that slide. But first, here's a couple of examples, like the S&P 500, I said that before. There's oil, I said that before. 10-year treasury notes, there's gold. So these are, these are standardized transactions. Everybody can see these prices out there, right? You can, go to the, uh, you can go to the New York Mercantile Exchange right now and see what these prices are. Uh, there at the bottom, there's the daily settlement. This is marking to market. This is just simply where a winner and a loser is declared at the end of every day. Those of you who know trading places, you know that Mortimer and Randolph, uh, the, the dude from the uh, exchange comes out and says, you owe us $376 million. And I'm like, oh my gosh, where are we going to get that money? So one of the brothers has a heart attack and uh, the movie ends. <laughs> Everyone is happy except for Duke and Duke. All right, how about similarities? Okay, hedging and speculative, pur speculative purposes, that makes sense. Uh, underlying assets, could be an interest rate, could be a currency, could be a commodity, could even be chocolate chips, right? Two parties agreeing, there's all sorts of risks there, market risk, credit risk, and operational risk. And, and by the way, in the chapter, each of those market, credit, and operational, they have separate kind of uh, paragraphs. So it's a really good exam question where you have the question stem that says, here's a contract between Jim and Betty. Uh, the, the price that they agreed to was $1.25. Uh, on uh, on the delivery date, the spot price of chocolate chip cookies is a dollar thirty one or a dollar thirty five or something. <clears throat> Betty delivers the cookies to Jim. The party is a success. Jim's wife is madly in love with him. What risk is described there? Well, that's just market risk, right? So the the, pl the the price just fluctuates. If the question said something like, "Oh my goodness gracious." Uh, the price is now $1.85, or what did I say earlier, $5, and Betty decides not to deliver those things. Or on the other hand, uh, maybe I don't, maybe I don't, I cancel the party and I say, I don't need those cookies. That's, that's credit risk right there. And then operational risk would be, hey, what if Betty's chocolate chip oven breaks down? Operational risk, you know, we know that definition about the failures of all those different kinds of things. So that's a really good question inside of those particular risks. But we've had multiple conversations about those in previous, in previous slide decks. Yeah, look at the bottom there. Can be used to manage financial exposures. All right, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and say that a different way. It ought to be used. It should be used. It should be used in every instance to manage financial exposures. And the ultimate decision would be something like, all right, we've identified it, we've quantified it, and now we have to decide whether we want to accept that risk or we want to transfer that risk or we want to use some kind of uh, derivative security. And if we decide to use the derivative security, then we have put together a gigantic Excel spreadsheet with all the possible chocolate chip cookie prices across the top and then all the possible outcomes across the bottom so that when one of those cells materializes and becomes reality, we say, oh yeah, this is exactly what we knew was going to happen. This is exactly what happens. And therefore, we've managed this risk. I'm not sure what a, uh, how would we manage the risk of an operational risk of Betty of Betty's oven breaking down. Now, what Betty could do is Betty could have a backup oven, right? That makes sense. But for us, how would we manage that risk? I guess we could say something like, this would work like a credit default swap. We could say over here, let me go over here to Johnny. Johnny makes chocolate chip cookies, but they're not quite as good. So I say to Johnny, hey, if, if Betty can't deliver a thousand cookies. Will you deliver? So so Johnny's over there. He's waiting for that phone call and I'm going to have to pay Johnny, you know, like a credit default swap. Maybe I'll pay him $5 a month to be able to be ready to deliver those, uh, those chocolate chip cookies. Uh, here we go. Summary differences. This is a great uh, slide. 
get your phone out, take a picture of this one here. Uh, this is a, pretty much a summary of what I've been saying uh, for the last, what's it been, 15 minutes or so. Um, notice down in the bottom right, this is a really good exam question. Usually the maturity on an organized exchange is, uh, you know, less than a year, probably way less than a year. You know, in the futures exchanges, they always talk about that near term contract. So that near term contract has this much volume and then the far term contract has this much volume. So, you know, you can get a year or less. Think about that for exchange traded uh, derivatives. But for over the counter, this is negotiable, right? We could say, I want to do this in 47 days or 163 days or some other non-standard amount. But we could also sign a swap contract in which we say, what was my earlier example? We were going to uh, swap uh, fixed for a floating rate until, I, until Jim dies. So that could, be, that could be many, many years. So look down that left hand. Uh, column. Each one of those is a potential exam question. What's the difference in market efficiency? What's the difference in transparency? And so if you remember my chocolate chip cookie example and all of its implications, of course, you probably won't get a chocolate chip cookie on the exam, but you might get lumber, you might get gasoline, you might get the S&P 500 index, but the same kind of a process applies. All right, here's the next set of really good questions. How do we how do we clear this? How do we settle this kind of this kind of a process? So the learning objective asks us to describe the process. And then the second part of this is identify the participants. So you already know who the participants are. They're they're all of you, right? Who do you guys work for? You know, you work for insurance companies, you work for financial institutions, you work for investment banks, you work for, you work for. So those are all the participants, right? It could be me, it could be just regular old Jim, a college professor. But if it's me, I'm probably not going to be a participant that anybody really cares about, right? I'll probably be a price taker and I'll be way in the back of the exchange and my trade will get executed, by, you know, at the end of the day as an afterthought. Uh, but if I'm a pension fund and I want to take a position in, uh, you know, let's say 5,000 S&P 500 index futures contracts, well, then I'm a big player, right? So identify the participants. I'm not quite sure that those are really good exam questions, but the collateral, that's probably the focus there. So let's, let's go ahead and do the first part here, clearing of a derivative transaction. So what do we do? We, you know, we sign the contract, right? We execute it. And then we need to manage all this all the way up to settlement because what happens? We're exposed to all different sorts of risk. We're exposed to market risk. We're exposed to operational risk. We're exposed to credit risk. So how do we uh, how do we handle all of this stuff? Well, what happens at execution? Lots of these organized exchanges and over the counter markets they'll require some kind of a margin, like a futures exchange requires a margin. So we'll have to put some of our own money up. Just think of it as a buffer, and that initial margin that's going to be that's our money, right? But what happens over time is the market risk sends current prices away from that predetermined forward price or futures price or exercise price or, uh, or swap price. And so we need to worry about things like, well, if the market price is moving against me, I might have to put up more of a margin. And so the exchange or the bank in charge of this over the counter market might say something like, Hey, Jim, we need another $10,000. Do you have 10,000 in cash laying around your house? And I'll say, probably I don't, but I have 10,000 in treasury bills. Will you take that? And they'll say, Ab absolutely. We'll take that. You know, so we need to worry about what happens to the value of the collateral. Of course, anyone's going to take uh, treasury securities. What if I say, Hey, you know what? I have a three-year-old John Deere lawnmower. Well, they might say, how much do you pay for that? And I'll say, Oh, I can't remember. I paid what $3,000 for it three or four years ago. And they'll say, you know what, if we sell it, how much could, uh, that's not a good one, right? That's not a good one. So, so any kind of collateral has to be marketable. It has to be liquid. You know, I've used this example before. I love giving this example because it's among my favorite historical movies and even relatively current movies. If I handed over the Pink Panther diamond, then you guys would be super happy with that collateral. 
Now, if this is a swap contract and we are exchanging fixed for floating cash flows, then we need to make sure that those payments are netted. We need to make sure that they're computed properly. And by the way, the, uh, the calculation of uh, the value of a swap and the calculation of those swap payments, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively simple conceptual time value of money, present value calculation, but it can get super, super complex. So that clearing has all those things uh, uh, as, as part of it. Settlement, on the other hand, uh, could be very simple. What we could just do on the settlement of the contract is say, okay, here's the price we agreed. Here's the price today. Let's just cash settle. And the overwhelming majority of all derivative contracts are, are cash settled because most parties are not really interested in owning or selling the underlying asset. It's just way easier to cash settle in the derivatives. And then if you have to take a position in the spot, you either buy or sell in the spot, and then you take your winnings or losings in the derivatives market to, to offset those, uh, those transactions. But remember, you know, this is a legal and binding contract, so we need to make sure that we satisfy the legalities of all of this. Uh, time horizon, yeah, I said this earlier, right? Exchange traded derivatives. These contracts are typically less than a year. And then when you hit the settlement, I mean, the cash settlement can occur, you know, very quickly within, let's say like that. But if we're actually taking delivery of the underlying asset, it might take a day or two, it might even take 15 days or even 30 days. I mean, think about it. If you and I agree to sell and buy uh, cattle, right? And so you want, you buy the cattle from me and you want it delivered in Montana. And I'm going to say, well, you know what? Will you take cash? And you'll say, no, no, I, I love those cattle over there. I want those. I visited those cattle in the barn. I, I love those. So I'll say, all right, well, I got to put them on my shoulder and I got to ship them. It's going to take me a while to get up there, right? Uh, over years or even decades for the over-the-counter derivatives. That's mostly, that's mostly with swaps. All right, so here's the, uh, here's the great question. Bilateral clearing. So these are both parties are responsible. So this is Betty and me and that kind of a, a forward contract trade that I talked about earlier. But there can be a central clearing. This could be a central clearinghouse corporation. It could be a central counterparty, depending on if we're on an organized exchange um, or in the over-the-counter market. Now, you know, I learned stuff when, I, when I'd when i read these uh, chapters. It's fascinating stuff for me. I would have thought that uh, central clearing kind of dominated it, but this reading says otherwise. I'll show you that here in just a second. But just remember the difference between uh, central clearing on both exchanges and then and then bilateral. Here, a couple slides here on the, on the participants. So we have large players. You know all about these people, medium-sized players. Uh, end users, large corporations. Uh, I give this example to my students all the time. I wonder if you're aware of the Southwest Airlines historically has hedged its uh, fuel price risk with tons and tons of futures contracts. But other airlines, um, they only hedge with a fraction of it. And I've seen some studies done. Southwest Airlines, sometimes 75%, sometimes 85%. Uh, but other airlines, maybe 10, maybe 15%. So it's just kind of a different attitude about hedging. So large corporations, uh, governments, financial institutions, so hedging needs. But we can also, we can also do this for speculation. You know, I mean, I, if I thought the price of sugar was going to rise dramatically, over the next uh, six months, I would just go to the exchange and say, hey, give me a million long positions in a sugar futures contract. And then if I'm right, then I make a bunch of money. I don't, I don't, I'm not a sugar farmer. I don't want to buy the sugar. I just want to speculate on the price. Now, the uh, inside of the chapter, there's this word that I feel will likely show up on the exam, directional positions, all right? So this can be the result of hedging. What you're doing in hedging, if you... Uh, 
if you benefit and when the spot market goes up, you take the opposite position in the derivatives market so that you can offset. And you can come up with a perfect hedge if the assets match in both markets and if the timing matches in both markets. Um, so remember that word directional. That can be true for hedging and it can be, do, and be true for speculating. Uh, some other participants here, uh, high credit entities. So these are high credit entities. These are people that you look at. These are entities that you look at and say, you know what, there's probably no chance that they're going to go ahead and default. And so we don't have to worry as much about all these other kinds of risks. So look at the example. Just think of the U.S. federal government. You know, is the U.S. federal government going to default on its treasury securities? I'm of the opinion that the answer to that question is uh, is no. Some other people say uh, other kinds of things, but I, I don't think it's happening, at least during my lifetime. So if they're not going to default on treasury securities, they're not going to default uh, on any kind of a swap or a futures contract. Um, let's see. So look at the top there. So they receive, but they don't have to post collateral as reflective by their their ability to have or at least project this high credit. You know, so uh, boy, rate triggering obligations, boy, if they're downgraded, you know, if the country, you forget about the USA, but if it's a different country is downgraded, well, they might have high credit reputation, but they still need to play by all of the types of rules. And then third party service providers. So settlement, margining, collateral management. I mean, you can imagine you guys probably know people. Maybe you even work in these industries. You know, there are tons and tons of people out there that offer their financial services to support the liquidity in these kinds of markets. So that should make perfect sense. All right. Exchange traded grouping. Uh, centrally cleared over the counter, uh, over the counter, collateralized over the counter, uncollateralized. So these are exactly what the uh, what the terms imply. Um, look up at the top exchange traded. Yeah, settled daily with cash payments. So this means that they have tremendous amounts of liquidity. They're generally considered to be super safe uh, over the counter market. These are um, less liquid, less safe. So maybe they're complex. They're probably less liquid. They're not standardized. And so they have regulations for central clearing and daily cash collateralization. So there might not be the actual actual exchange of cash like on an exchange, uh, but there is some kind of a daily settlement. And then if they're collateralized, just think of treasury securities or think of the uh, Pink Panther Diamond and then uncollateralized. This is like anarchy out there, right? Uh, who knows what's going to happen if there's no collateral posted, there's no Pink Panther Diamond, there are no treasury securities. Think of it as my John Deere tractor. That doesn't really help us. You know, so this is the slide I was telling you about. I can't imagine the Institute would, uh, I'm sorry, that GARP would ask you this question here. But this is what I was saying earlier. Boy, I was really surprised down at the bottom right there, you know, of these uh, over-the-counter market, 20% are uncollateralized. And so, you know, I try to do lots of reading in uh, uh, academic, financial, and economic journals, and I don't really come across those kinds of things. But after reading this chapter, I'm going to go do some search for uncollateralized over-the-counter derivatives just to kind of gain some more knowledge about it. But this gives you a sense of the difference between, you know, what's going on here. Over-the-counter market, 91% to 9% of the total market share, centrally cleared. I would have thought that was 80 or 90%, but there's bilateral 40%. That's a little bit more than what I, what I had thought. So, uh, you know, I can't imagine that GARP would ask you these kinds of questions, but you know what? I'm not the official exam uh, creator. Let's take a look at a couple of slides here on end users and some potential exam questions here. Notice we have some bolded, um, bolded terms and bolded words in here. So these are probably these are probably good words to know and terms to know for exam questions. So what was I saying earlier? There's that word directional again. So directional hedging. So we're offsetting economic risks. Uh, the problem, of course, is that if if we have substantial market risk, you know, prices going way up, prices going way down. And when we have to do this marketing to market on a daily basis, so this volatility then, this market risk is going to add to the kind of stress of managing this derivative over its life, 
right? So we're going to price this every day. So we're either going to win or lose. And then if we lose, you know, we can post some treasuries. If we lose, we can post some more treasuries. If we lose, then boy, are we going to post the Pink Panther Diamond? Probably not, but we could do that. But then we need to worry about collateral needs. So that, that makes perfect sense there. Um, sometimes there are substantial collateral requirements that say, you know what, if you lose $10,000 today, we're not going to be satisfied if you just put up $10,000 worth of treasuries. You need to do $10,000 worth of treasuries and then $10,000 worth of municipal bonds and then the Pink Panther Diamond and then and then. And so the logistics of this can be super stressful. Um, this concept of one to one hedging limits the benefits of netting. You know, so imagine a company like Southwest Airline who loves to use these futures contracts to hedge its uh, the price, its input price risk of, of fuel. And so you can imagine that it has a bunch of near term contracts. Let's say they mature in a month, but then they have some that mature in three months and six months because it wants to hedge uh, farther out. Well, you know, what tends to happen over time is that uh, Southwest Airlines is probably not only hedging in the oil market, maybe it's hedging in the gasoline futures market, maybe it's hedging in some other derivative, maybe it has an option, maybe it has a swap contract. You know, swap contracts are so cool because you could swap almost anything. So they might they might swap one grade of fuel for another grade of fuel, thinking that those prices are going to either diverge or converge. And so when you have all these contracts out there, you just do netting. And so if you win a bunch over here and you lose a bunch over here and those two bunches happen to be the same number, well, then you don't have to worry about uh, any cash flows. But when you do this one-to-one -one hedging, uh, then you may have to be uh, duly concerned about what, the, what those uh, risk mitigation processes are. There can also be an instrument mismatch, and this occurs for a variety of reasons. I mean, the obvious reason is that if you own a, if you own, a, let's say you own a municipal bond that has a coupon rate of 10 percent and it's a fixed rate and you want to swap that particular bond with a floating rate well there is no there is no futures contract or swap contract out there that's going to exactly match that municipal bond. So you have to use a treasury or you have to use some other kind of a floating rate. You know, in the old days it was LIBOR. Now we use the uh, secured overnight financing rate. You know, so you have some kind of mismatches. Um, in addition to mismatches is with timing and the underlying asset, there might be mismatches due to different bank practices. So one bank might say, you know, what we'll take treasury securities another bank will say you know what we want securities issued by the country of iceland you know so you got to worry about gosh do i go to iceland and buy one of their sovereign bonds how do i do that with collateral so um, there are all sorts of just think about headaches you know look at that dude there he looks like he has a migraine there from worrying about all this kind of stuff now, this mismatch can uh, can even work if it's with the same bank. And this is because, as you guys know from the U.S. rules and, you know, European rules as well, is that, you know, sometimes we're worrying about the bank book and sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes we're worrying about the trading book. You know, remember that the, the government says something like, you know what, if you have a security that's available for sale, you got to put it over here. If you're going to hold it to maturity, you have to put it over here. What's the difference in liquidity? What's the difference in those cash flows? So even inside of the same bank, you might, you might get this mismatch. <clears throat> All right, one quick uh, slide on, you know, these banks and how banks deal with uh, volatility and counterparty risk. Uh, this is just a quick slide here before we get to the next uh, the next learning objective. You know they, you know banks. What do they do? You know they got a bunch of stuff on the right hand side. They have a bunch of stuff on the left hand side of the balance sheet. So it makes sense in a perfect world that every time a liability 
comes due, uh, loan matures over here on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, and you have perfect matching. But of course, of course you can't have perfect matching. That never works, so we need to hedge. And we're gonna hedge with each one of these derivative securities and so we need to, uh, of course, maintain and worry about all the margin requirements, worry about all the market risk and the counterparty risk, especially counterparty risk. We need to worry about symmet symmetry or asymmetry of cash flows. We need to worry about, you know, I'm not going to go back to that slide. Where are we in, are we in the 60% or the 40% or the 80% and the 20% or the uh 91% or the 9%, where are we in there? And that's gonna impact uh, our counterparty risk. Of course, we gotta worry about uh, liquidity as well. Now remember <clears throat> that even though forward contracts go back to Julius Caesar and the Roman Empire, that there really was no governing body out there to keep control. I guess Caesar was the governing body out there. Who knows what happened during the Middle Ages? Uh, but of course, uh, you know, a couple of decades ago, this International Swaps and Derivatives Association was created. And this is really, you know, it can be characterized as just kind of a governing body of derivatives. It's really kind of a trade organization. And so what they've come up with is this master agreement. And it contains all of the elements that you would think ought to be in some kind of a master agreement that says something like, look, if you're going to enter into the derivative market, you need to behave like this and this and this. You know, it's no different than the uh, the USGA or the Royal RNA. Those of you who are golfers, you'll know that the these golfing gods, right? These trade organizations, they say something like, you know what? In order for it to be a legal round of golf, you have to play with a golf ball that has these kinds of dimensions and the putter has to be like this and the driver and all this kind of stuff. So they have all of these rules. In fact, uh, you know, in the last year, I watch a lot of golf because I love, I love playing and, and watching golf. But there have been two professionals who have had two-stroke penalties imposed on them uh, at the end of a round because they in, took an improper drop. Uh, when they were in a hazard or had an unplayable lie, I forget exactly what it was. You know, so there's the rules out there in golf, and here are the rules associated with derivatives. So just remember this as kind of, you know, this is, this is the governing body, and their motivation, their purpose is to make trading happy, to make these things, to make these derivative securities financial weapons of mass construction. Oh my gosh, right? That's what we need to turn these in. And the ISDA, that, that's its goal. So they tell you all about these uh, lessening of risk factors. So collateral, netting, events, closeout process. Here's just a quick slide on, uh, on an agreement um, between Santander and Holmes funding. This goes back to the last decade um, in this master agreement, and these are probably some good exam questions in here. What are the default events that covered? Now, we, uh, we mentioned just a few of these in my chocolate chip cookie example. Failure to pay, breach, credit, support, default, right? Misrepresentation. We didn't really talk about this. So uh, that was a little bit in what I was saying with the 12 chocolate chips per cookie. Maybe Betty puts two, maybe she puts 50 in there, right? She could misrepresent on either side. <clears throat> I mean, if you have too many chocolate chips in a cookie, it still makes it bad, right? You'd rather have too many than too few, although some people might argue with me. <clears throat> Specific transaction default, we did this. Cross default, we didn't do this. <clears throat> uh, this would be if, uh, if I hired for my party, if I hired Betty to do the chocolate chip cookies, and I hired um, Elizabeth over here to do the fish, and I hired uh, Robert over here to do the fillet, you know, I would have I would have three forward contracts, and let's just suppose for some crazy reason that that uh, what did I say Elizabeth and Betty and Robert, let's suppose they're brother and sisters, and let's suppose that they all operate out of the same building and something terrible happens to the building, it floods. So default one here would lead to default there, and that would lead to bankruptcy or insolvency. There's the next one. <clears throat> 
And then, yeah, here's one that we, we didn't talk about. Suppose that Betty gets taken over by Nestle's chocolate, right? And Nestle looks at me and says, you know what, Jim, a thousand cookies. There's no way that I'm, uh, there's no way that I'm delivering a thousand cookies to your wife's. I don't care how much you love your wife. I'm not doing this because I'm going to sell a billion cookies over there. Uh, here's a good picture about the proliferation of some particular uh, derivative securities. Notice there's the big hump there. So there's the financial crisis. So the reading has several comments about uh, pre-global financial crisis and post-global financial crisis. So clearly it hit a peak. And then right after that peak, politicians, especially in the United States, they came out and said, oh, greedy Wall Street bankers, these highly risk derivative securities, we don't want to have anything to do with them. And but uh, I will I will say that of course that financial crisis what it did is it made us become better better identifiers of risk, uh, quantifiers of risk, and managers uh, of risk. And so the reading goes into this concept of a credit default swap, and these things are really about the coolest things out there. Credit default swap. This is what I was saying about what did I say, Johnny? If I said to Johnny, "Hey, if Betty can't deliver the cookies to me, will you deliver your cookies?" So that's pretty much what a credit default swap is. It's really just insurance insuring a. Uh, credit instrument. Hey, it could be almost any credit instrument, of course, except a treasury. You'd be nuts to enter uh, uh, to pay for a credit default swap on a treasury, unless you think the U.S. government is going to default. Should be obvious from our bullet points there and the illustration that these are features and use of credit derivatives. So that takes care of that uh, that learning objective. I'm not quite sure that's a really uh, the better exam question here, but the better one is discuss potential risks. So let's do that on this slide here. Yeah, credit default swaps, highly toxic. So I I'm going to go ahead and say I, I would like to have written uh, credit default swaps. They should never be highly toxic. They should never be highly toxic because we know all these things. But of course, when they're misapplied, uh, magnified losses, you know, you can just do a quick a quick search and say, hey, who lost a lot of money in the credit default swap market in 2008? And you get bunches and bunches of people, some of whom are very famous, some of whom made a comment about, about uh, financial weapons of mass, uh, of mass destruction. Yeah, there's lots of counterparty risk in these CDS contracts because you know, if you get a financial institution to agree to make a maturity bond payment in the event of default on that original issuer, well, who knows what that counterparty looks like? What is that? What is that third party? What is that financial institution that you've entered this derivative contract look like? And of course, remember, these credit default swaps, they have tenors of five years and seven years. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen one for 50 years, but, you know, uh, Walt Disney and Coca-Cola at the turn of the century, they issued a uh, hundred year bonds. So I guess you could get a credit default swap. So what is that? There's 75 years left on that. You could get a 75 year credit default swap on, on those bonds. Probably no one would sell it to you, but you could theoretically. And so that's counterparty risk. Lots of things can happen over the next 75 years, but clearly lots of things can happen over the next five or seven years, right? So this is what I was saying earlier about increased market awareness. This is just us, you know, knocking ourselves on the head. You remember Back to the Future? Biff says to George, hello, McFly. That's what this... Uh, financial crisis did to everybody that was using credit default swaps and other derivative securities, you know, how could you not know this, right? Yeah, I love going back to Eugene Fama, who came up in, you know, around 1970, this idea of uh, efficient markets hypothesis, and then, of course, you know, Nobel Prizes and all that. You know, I still, I still believe that markets are efficient. I still believe that. I know that they are in the long term. But I also know that there are lots and lots of pockets of inefficiency out there. And there are lots and lots of individuals out there trying to take advantage of those pockets of inefficiency. You know, I love having conversations with my students about high frequency traders, but the misuse of credit and the misuse means in this case, not knowing what you're doing. 
uh, you know, I, I use this example with my cousin all the time and my family and even my students, you know, in, in U.S. football, in football, you know, the, uh, the analytics people have taken over. Football coaches have no idea when to go for two. They have no idea when to go for it on fourth down. They have no idea when to kick a field goal. They have no idea how to do this stuff. And the announcers say, oh, the analytics say do this. But the analytics lead you down the wrong path. This is the same thing here in the credit derivative market. Here's this marginal cost, marginal benefit that I've been saying here. I like this. On the one hand, these are all the really good things that uh, derivatives do. On the other hand, these are the things that we should be able to manage if we identify and quantify all of these risks. We shouldn't have to worry about these kinds of things. Now, of course, counterparty risk has to be managed dynamically. Valuations have to be managed dynamically. Downgrades and upgrades and liquidity and daisy chain, these things need to be managed dynamically. So we enter this uh, derivative contract today and we don't just put it out in our garage and not worry about it. We need to stay on this every single day so that we're not caught, so that we're not caught with, well, there you go, financial weapons of mass destruction down at the bottom. So if you do this dynamically, then it's not a double-edged sword. If you do it statically or you don't know what you're doing, then it's a triple-edged sword. Is that something out there? A quadruple or a quintuple-edged sword? So for the exam, I would know the advantages and the disadvantages. These are, these are great and standard exam questions. All right, let's move to the uh, let's move to the clearing. So, what are we doing here? We call this central clearing in the over-the-counter market, right? On the organized exchanges, we typically have a clearinghouse corporation, which could be the exchange itself. So, here we have this process of central clearing, where we have you know, some kind of a third party, this central counterparty out there, um, write separate contracts with the buyer and the seller. Why do we do this? Well, look at the objectives. I mean, this makes perfect sense. What is the objective? The objective is to prevent all of this purple stuff from occurring. Yeah, what's the mechanism? So there are two, there are two contracts, right? Terms of trade, even if one party defaults. Global adoption. So this goes back. Uh, well, let me go back here. This goes back to, this goes back to you know the ISDA and all of this master agreement. The results of all that means that you know what, uh, we're better off today than we were before. But we shouldn't be any better off today. We should have known all this stuff a long, long time ago. You know, I tell my students when they ask me questions about a certain assignment, and I purposely give vague instructions on assignments, and I look at them and I say, figure it out. And they don't like that because students, they want to have, and candidates too, they want to say, Jim, teach me this and this and this, and test me on this and this and this. Because when I get to the world in which I have a supervisor, my supervisor is going to say, do this and this and this. But it doesn't work that way, of course. Your supervisor says, I want to report. I want it done by five o'clock. You figure it out. All right, how about advantages of central clearing? This is exactly what we've been talking about. Reduce all sorts of risks that are out there. Reduce credit risk, in particular counterparty risk. Reduce market risk, reduce operational risk. And then transparency. You know, whenever you hear of somebody introducing a new product or a trade organization or, you know, some kind of um, uh, loosely defined entity, when they say, you know what, this is a good thing because it's going to increase transparency. Most of the time they're right, uh, but sometimes that they're not. Now, the problems with central clearing is that if, let's suppose I'm Jim's central clearer and I have contracts with all of you people out there. Well, you guys all might think that you're diversified, but what happens if I fail, right? Then all of you people out there, you know, so concentration risk. So this word, this systemic importance, you know, this goes, this has its roots going back to 1980s where we decided, you know, that some people, some banks, uh, you know, we need to, we need to bail them out. Savings and Loans Association, Continental, you know, you got all these things back in the 80s and the 90s. And so it's come up recently in the last couple of decades of, you know, too big to fail. 
I don't really know what that means, but that just sounds to me like a way for somebody out there to say, you're too big to bail, so we're ready to bail you out. Uh, limited scope, operational complexity, those are obvious notions here. So what about margin requirements? Remember what I said, margin is just kind of a buffer. So we have this initial margin. Uh, what that means is that when we enter this uh, contract, both sides, long and short positions or buy and sell positions, they've got to put up a margin. And what that does is, uh, the, if, especially if we're marking to market on the very next day, well, that acts as a buffer, worst case liquidation or closeouts. And so cash variation margin, um, a lot of times this is called a maintenance margin. And so this fluctuates over time, whether you got to increase or decrease. And then lots and lots of uh, centrally cleared derivatives have a default fund in which they'll say something like, all right, put in, we're going to require you to put in uh, initial margin. And by the way, let me take a dollar of that and I'm going to put it in a default fund over here. So I'll put a dollar in and another dollar and another dollar. And soon this default fund has a billion dollars. And so that's used as a gigantic buffer. So just remember these margins are unique characteristics of trade buffers, but then the default fund, the default fund is like the giant, the giant buffer. Yeah, so what happens if we have extreme situations? You hear this term all the time. Haircutting, you hear this term all the time. Tearing up, you hear this uh, term. Well, let's go into the buffer, make sure there's enough money in the buffer. You know, so there are all different sorts of scenarios that occur out there, but essentially some people are going to have to take a loss. <laughs> Uh, so extreme situations, it's either take a loss that uh, is up to the initial investment or take a partial loss. So these things kind of work out. Uh, this is a good slide for a couple of potential exam questions. Uh, I told you before that this chapter kind of delineates between the pre-global financial crisis and the post-global financial crisis. I don't know that these are really, really good questions, but some of this pre-stuff and the post-stuff, you know, so there's uh, the G20 leader. So there's the Basel committee, and then there's the the security commi uh, committees out there and the working group. And so what, what these organizations or these kind of trade people uh, they establish comprehensive guidelines. So these are in addition to uh, what we talked about before. Uh, look at the notional amounts down at the bottom, you know, so boy, three trillion, eight billion, you know, whatever that is. I don't know that those are good uh, exam questions, but look down at the bottom right, you know, there could be delays. There's, uh, there's COVID, you know, we're years out of COVID now. Hopefully we never hear of COVID uh, again. Hopefully we never hear of the next one again. But, but what these uh, non-centrally cleared derivatives and these rules and regulations are trying to do is to prevent, you know, the next financial crisis. All right, here are great exam questions. We've talked about uh, special purp purpose vehicles and all these other extra kind of things. So uh, I've said this to you in previous recordings, but I'll go ahead and repeat myself. So all of these things are, you know, suppose I'm a bank and I'm a financial institution and I have, you know, I have a balance sheet with assets and liabilities and equity over here. And so whenever I enter into a derivative contract, uh, my whole bank is exposed to all of those risks that we have talked about. But what happens if I go outside of my bank? And here's the example that I have used before. Hopefully you remember this. I go out into my parking lot of the bank and I construct a tent. Now that tent, it's on my property, right? But it's a separate legal entity and I can call it anything I want. You know, one of these three things here in the learning objectives, I can call it anything I want, but what I'm gonna do is I'm going to trade inside of that tent as a separate legal entity. And that separate legal entity has its own balance sheet. It has its own income statement and cash flows. Now, what I could do is I could take some of my assets and I could put some of those assets inside of that tent. And that's typically what happens with uh, uh, special purpose purpose vehicles, but it doesn't have to be. But what it enables us to do is manage in the context of this particular chapter, it allows us to manage derivatives and all of those kinds of risks in the absence or in the differentiation of bankruptcy rules. 
because what we can do is we can say something like, if I'm Jim's bank and I go bankrupt, my special purpose vehicle, my special purpose vehicle out in my parking lot, that tent still exists. So my building could be crumbling down, but that tent still exists. So it's a ways, way of separating. It's a way of managing uh, third party or counterparty risk. And then we have different bankruptcy rules. Now, there are lots and lots of good things about that, which I just described, but um, go back to Enron back in the year, whatever year that was, 1999 or 2000, Enron had a bunch of these special purpose vehicles and Enron told us, they told us they were putting natural gas fields and oil fields in this thing uh, as the assets in there. And we were like, oh yeah, those are worth a lot of money. Let's go ahead and trade. We don't really care, right? We have those assets. Well, when the price of energy fell, and uh, Enron started losing inside of their special purpose vehicle, then we as investors, we said, all right, let's go in, let's open up the tent, let's see the oil wells and the natural gas reservoirs. And we opened up the tent and there was nothing in there. <laughs> all right, so legal evolution, we need to make certain that the legal structure is appropriate, it conforms to state or province rules or country rules. Uh, and we need to make sure we know what happens about the enforceability, what goes on inside the tent. That's what we need to know. How about derivative product com uh, companies? These things um, are bankruptcy remote. So this is what I was talking about, the special purpose vehicle. So those things over there and what goes on inside of the tent is usually a market neutral kind of an investment. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go in there and we can buy whatever we want, right? We can do any kind of a derivative and we can throw any, we can throw a stock or a bond in there if we wanted to, but mostly, I mean, see, since these are called derivative product companies, we'll mostly throw uh, derivatives in there and we want to take a market neutral position with uh, offsetting long and short positions. So we use lots and lots of quantitative models in there to identify what that, uh, market neutral position looks like, how do we quantify it? And then how do we achieve it according to, you know, the rules of the construction of this DPC? Yeah, tightly linked uh, with the parent's financial health. Remember I said that the special purpose vehicle, those were kind of separate, but here, if that thing fails, then, then or if I fail as the bank, then that thing is probably in financial help. There we have some two examples in there. So what this does is that transforms that counterparty risk into some of those other risks that we uh, that we have talked about. Uh, here, these uh, mono insurance companies, these almost never showed up anywhere in the world except for the Wall Street Journal back in 1995 and 2002. But after the 2008 financial crisis, we were asking ourselves the question, who are these, uh, who are these entities out there? And so, I mean, what they do is they just uh, establish financial guarantees to whoever asks for it. And mostly, mostly these are banks, mostly these are in, uh, excuse me, institutions that issue bonds. So there's, it's just some kind of a financial guarantee. It's kind of like, it's kind of like they were around before credit default swaps became available. And then the credit default swaps became this hugely popular thing. But these mono insurance companies, these, these are still out there. And so um, um, what we need to do is make sure that we can identify and quantify and uh, and manage all the risks that we've talked about. What's important here, uh, establish for high quality counterparties. So you have another layer of insurance on top of the credit ability of a particular counterparty or a third party or, uh, you know, whoever it is out there. Limitations here, yeah, heavily reliant on maintaining those high credit ratings, which of course was the big failure back in the 2008 financial crisis. Of course, these mono insurance companies, they got to worry about uh, mark to market. They got to worry about parent company stability and they've got to worry about rapid defaults. And there's a couple of examples that uh, you guys are probably familiar with. Credit derivative product companies, yeah, critical need for high credit quality counterparties. Um, this extends, let me go back here real quick. So we have this model here, the DPC. What we're going to do is extend this 
to look at the structured world in finance. So you guys know that there are these structured notes out there. And this is not just limited to a CDPC, but you know, they kind of focus on this. You know, if I'm a if I'm a financial institution and I issued a I issue a structured note that sounds something like, hey, send me your money today, buy this structured note, and what I'll do is I'll pay you a coupon payment every three months or every six months based on the return of the S&P 500 index or the return on the performance of the euro versus the US dollar or the quality of Betty's chocolate chip cookies uh, over time. You know, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to maintain that high rating, you know, through through a support of these uh, CD product companies. Limitations, right, highly sensitive to market risk, highly sensitive to credit downgrades. That's probably the really good exam question here. Now, what about modeling? We've had great conversations about value at risk. We've had great conversations about expected shortfall. We've had great conversations about historical simulation. And by the way, in my, uh, in my investments class, we're doing, uh, we're trying to do some kind of a limited Monte Carlo simulation. We're doing value at risk. Uh, I do expected losses in there. So, you know, so we're doing this here at the undergraduate level. You know, so imagine you know, these models, counterparty risk metrics as well. Oops, let me go back here. You know, so let's do value at risk here and expected shortfall. So what do we know about value at risk? You know, we take the normal distribution. It doesn't have to be normal, but it would probably be normal, especially if we're computing value at risk after a Monte Carlo simulation. But what do we know about value at risk? You know, it's that stuff that occurs at the tail, you know, the wrong tail. But then we extend that into expected shortfall and we try to chop that tail into its individual components so we can have a better ability to identify each chopped tail inside of the value at risk. So you see what's happening here. We have one measure of risk, then we add a measure of risk, then we add another way and then another way. So this depends on modeling. So we have all of these modeling risks that are associated with uh, each of these methods to try to manage uh, uh, all of this uh, third party risk and counterparty risk. A couple of other things to consider as we wrap up this slide. Uh, complexity in counterparty risk. Um, yeah, adding layers of complexity because we have to forecast years and years ahead, which looks at, you know, maybe we're talking specifically about a swap contract. Correlations, we know about this from conversations going back even before you watched any of my slides. You know, what do we rely on? We rely on low correlations to help us with diversification, but we know during financial market crashes that those correlations, then they converge. You know, they all don't go to one, but just when we need them, uh, those, uh, those things fail us. And then we can't rely on historical correlation coefficients uh, to predict future uh, correlation. So we need to go beyond correlation. We've talked about the copulas, we talked about wrong way risk, talked about right way risk. So that takes us through this super exciting uh, conversation on derivative securities. Notice that inside of this slide deck, we had no learning objectives that sounded like compute or demonstrate or any of those things, just describe and define. So I think we did a pretty good job of doing all that. I've tried to alert you to, you know, high probability questions on the exam, but I think we were pretty broad and pretty deep uh, as we went through this slide deck. So, hey, uh, thanks for watching. Have a great day and good luck studying.